I'm Tim. I'm one of the elders here. I serve as the lead pastor, lead teaching pastor. Um, man, this morning I walked in and someone had painted our benches out front and like repolished them and put some sweet Bible verses on there. I have no idea who did that, but they look amazing. I'm sure I'll find out soon enough, but um, super cool. That, that blessed my heart to see that. Last Sunday I walked in and somebody, whether it was a neighborhood kid or who knows, homeless or something like that, kid come and yanked all these succulents out of the planter. And so I'm like, man, who does stuff like this? And then Somebody was like, hey, welcome to Oceanside. I said, I know, I know. But anyways, but uh, so replant them. A little bit different vibe. So thank you for whoever uh, painted the, the benches. They look beautiful. Uh, the second thing I wanted to share was um, hopefully you got the email this week, the newsletter. In that newsletter, there's a link to a survey. And I really want to encourage you guys to take the time to fill that out. It probably takes like two or three minutes. And it just is an inventory of how everybody's doing and then one of the questions at the very end is just relative to your comfort level on gathering. Tomorrow there's going to be a press conference um, from Governor Newsom about uh, houses of worship. So we're going to get some updates tomorrow about what we're allowed to do. So uh, the good news is we're getting closer. So we're, we're getting a lot closer to be able to gather again. So that it's coming soon. Praise God. And uh, let's just be praying because uh, that has been a divisive issue so the church is dividing over that which is so tragic to me that something like gathering together again is is creating divisions amongst uh, but that's just what happens sometimes so um if if you're asked about those things um and you're curious about the way our our church is handling them we want to do things legally and um and we want to be a witness to our neighbors here we're a neighborhood church and all, all of you who gather with us on Sundays. No, we're right smack dab in the middle of South O. So it's different than maybe a megachurch off on a hill where nobody cares and they don't see them. We have neighbors that are looking right out their driveway into our property. And I think it's very important that we're a good witness that we say, uh, reflect to them that we care about public health and that, um, and yet at the same time, we really value gathering and when they give us permission that we're going to do that the right way. So um, that's where, that's our elder stance. And so uh, we're excited, though. We think the day's coming very soon. Um, the The third thing that I had before I jump into this is just tomorrow's Memorial Day. And as a church that was founded in the founding name and still the legal name of our church, uh, our, our DBA, it, or our fictitious business name is Generation Church, but our, our actual legal name for this church is Service Memorial Southern Baptist Church. This church was started... 68 years ago, primarily for Marines who had relocated to a very fledgling town called Oceanside that had a whole lot of nothing. And uh, a group of people said, we need to start a church. There's not any churches around here. And let's make one that gives them a little taste of home because there's a lot of people that relocated from the south out here. And that's sort of our story as a church in some way. And so serve as Memorial, and it happens to be Memorial Day tomorrow. And um, not just in light of a holiday, taking the days off for our bros and Bibles on Monday nights, but it's a day that I think, as a civilian and a and a someone who didn't serve in the military, it's it's easy to just make that a day off work and a well, as in the past for a lot of us that was a day. Well, cool. Now Sunday night I can black out and because I got a whole day of Monday to recover. You know, it's like well. Actually, it's a day that we take some time to celebrate all those that have given their lives to serve our country. And some of us in this church family have lost relatives. And, um, and right now, take that risk as your spouses or loved ones are deployed overseas. And so uh, I want to take a moment of silence and prayer today together to honor those in the United States Armed Forces, whatever division of military they are, because we're united in in our service to our country. So if you join me in just a moment of prayer and reflection and thanks to those who have lost their lives and to the families that have shared in that loss with us, let's take a moment. Amen. Thank you, God, for those that 
have paid the ultimate price to serve our country. Uh, and thank you for those that serve right now. Uh, God, you're good. We praise you. We ask that you to fill this time together as a church, uh, that we would know you more deeply. And um, as we talk about prayer today, Father, I pray that uh, you would help us to understand your heart and what you mean by prayer as we see in Jesus' life. Help us to just learn this morning in our minds. Help our hearts to be changed as we interact with you, that we become more like you and uh, change our hands as well and the way that we carry out our lives and the, and the lives that we touch and the things that we do to serve. We, we ask that you'd meet us this morning and, and meet and change me as well, even as I teach. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to just have Allison come up, my wife, and she's going to do our scripture reading for this morning. It's going to be from Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 19. And um, give you a second to turn with us. I'm just going to hold it for you. That way you can just, okay. you can just focus on reading. But uh, yeah, if you're at home, go ahead and take a moment to thumb over on your Bible. to so Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 19. And we're picking up right after where we left off last week when Jesus healed the man's hand on Sabbath. I'll give it a three count. Three, two, one, set, hike. One day, soon after, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem, and from as far north as the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. When they, they had come to hear him and to be healed of their disease, and by those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him, because healing power went out from him, and he healed everyone. This is God's word. Thank you. Whoa, you have it. All right. Well, we are continuing our three-week series on the ways of Jesus looking at some of the spiritual disciplines, as people would call them. And uh, I want to just take a moment to remind you, and I've been reiterating this every week, that the ways of Jesus, these spiritual disciplines, are not a method to earn God's grace for us. If you do them, if you fast, if you Sabbath, as you pray, you're not becoming more pleasing to God. He's not more happy with you because of your works. He's already pleased with you because of Christ. These things God has shown us, and in Jesus' life, he's modeled for us because they're a way to access the grace that we already have. They're a way to be reminded of who God is and what he's done, who we are in light of that. And then in, in prayer and in many of these things, find out what we're supposed to do out of that new identity. Sometimes it's very much uh, it's information transfer, and I think even we'll see this in this, in this text that Allison just read. Uh, we're, we're making space more than anything for relationship. So if that's fasting... If it's, it's Sabbath, what we talked about last week, in prayer, we're creating space for relationship. That if we don't, that space gets squeezed right out of us and into all the other things that drag us through life. So the title that I came up with today for this message is simply that, making space. Uh, that, that's, that's prayer in a nutshell. Uh, so before I jump into this, there's some expectations I want to set because... Uh, our mission is uh, to lead people into healthy relationships with Jesus and each other, and, and relationships, expectations are uh, the key destroyer of relationships, is unmet expectations. So an expectation for today is you won't be a master of prayer after today. So uh, expectation is I can't in one sermon teach you all there is to know about prayer. So just recognize I'm going to try to give you a little, little slice of the pie and hopefully something that's really helpful, and specifically from the life of Jesus, because there's all kinds of different ways to pray. So I want to make that known. There's great teachings and books. I'm going to reference a couple today. And even workshops. Our prayer team here, we had a workshop, a prayer workshop, a couple months ago prior to the 
the uh, pandemic and all that, and we had lunch together, and we're going to continue to do prayer workshops as part of our life as a church. I, I feel very strongly that if, if we screw everything else up, but we commit ourselves to pray and pray regularly, and we equip each other to pray well, we are going to see things change, not only in our own lives, but people around us. Um, so uh, that, that's the heart that I'm coming to today. There's also a tension when you talk about prayer between the organic and the organized. There's uh, rightly, there's argument to don't overcomplicate prayer. You know, it's, it's your relationship with God. You're talking to God, and it can happen at any time, anywhere, and you're, you're meant, Paul says, to pray without ceasing. So there's a, an organic nature to prayer, which is really not that complex. But there's also an organized aspect of prayer where a lot of people ask, and they, even on our church chat from a few weeks ago, people ask, how do I grow in prayer? What, can you give me some tools or ideas? So there is an organized. Um, another way of saying it would be the, the spontaneous versus the intentional. You know, there's, there's spontaneous relationship where you just, oh, you're hanging out, cool, what are we going to do? And then there's intentional. Uh, you know, you plan an anniversary trip, hopefully, and there's things that you do that you put in your schedule to make sure that you're valuing time with somebody. So it's both and, and I don't think a healthy prayer life is lacking on either of them. It, and I would also say it's, it's harmony, not balance. So it's a, lot, a lot of times, in, in we think balance, and we think, well, okay, well, you don't want to have too much of one or it'll weigh down the other. No, no in, in God's economy, there's harmony. It's, it's 100% one and 100% the other one, and not... Uh, neither is taking away from the other. They're not mutually exclusive. So prayer is, is organized and it's organic. And so hopefully we'll see some of that in this sermon here. Um, so uh, I think probably a good place to start when we're talking about prayer is just what is it? So I'm going to give you just my personal definition. You can take this with a grain of salt, but this is the observation number one for today. If you want to take some notes or journal. Actually, today would probably be, well, every Sunday is probably a good day to have a journal, but uh, today is one that if you wrestle with praying more, I, this would be helpful to journal some of these things, but the first observation is that prayer is your ongoing conversation with God. Simple. It's ongoing because it's always happening, and it, well, you, if you choose to, it's ongoing, and it's a conversation with God, so in a conversation, both parties speak and both parties listen, and so I want to make sure that we capture that as our first observation. Uh, one of the books that's helped me the most in life, when, and there's probably a handful, but this one really hits my heart. It's called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. The subtitle is Connecting with God in a Distracting World. And he says this about prayer. He says, prayer is simply the medium through which we experience and connect to God. Oddly enough, many people struggle to learn how to pray because they're focusing on prayer, not on God. He continues by saying, trying to dissect how prayer works is like using a magnifying glass to try to figure out why a woman is beautiful. If you turn God into an object, he has a way of disappearing. See, since that relational overtone, that, that, that dialogue overtone. So my hope for, for today is that you don't come away being a master. My hope is that you just have some progress. We're looking for progress, not perfection. And that you might have even one tool to use in your life and your rhythm of life that you might develop a deeper, ongoing, fuller dialogue with your Father in heaven. So let's do that by looking at the verses that we just read. So if you've got your Bible, we're going back to Luke 6. And uh, Jesus is going to give us a really amazing example of prayer because in Luke 6, chapter 12, it says that one day soon afterwards, speaking of the event that we read about last week and healing the, hand, the man's hand on Sabbath, one day soon after that, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. And he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names and then we list the names. So, as we mentioned, we're on the heels of last week on this teaching about Sabbath and the Pharisees being really upset with Jesus about healing this man's hand. Um, and then he selects his 12. So he goes up all night, it says, to pray. And then he comes down and he had many disciples at this point, but he set apart 12 specifically to be his apostles. An apostle, that word comes from the Greek word apostolos, which just means sent one. 
These were going to be his 12 that he was going to start with to send out to do the proclamation work of ministry, both during his time on earth and then after he resurrects. 12, the number is significant because Jesus is showing us that he is starting a new nation of Israel. Essentially, the 12 represent the 12 tribes of Israel. We're going to look at that in a couple weeks when I talk specifically about discipleship here. But for the focus of today, I want to draw your attention to what Jesus is doing. Jesus goes to be with the Father. And in verse 12, it says he went on a mountain to pray, and then he prayed all night. And uh, that's not the tool for today, is not to pray all night. Although, I'm sure it'd be really effective and and helpful. Um, That might be a takeaway for you, is to dedicate a night to prayer. But what the heck was he doing all night? I mean, that's a long time to be up on a hill praying, right? So, I'm curious about what the original Greek says here. The original Greek, the word for prayer used is prozukasai, which means to supplicate or ask for things and worship. The, it comes from a root word, prosuke, which implies or oratory or oration or speaking things. It, act, it literally is a conversation or talking. Isn't that interesting? So it's not far-fetched. When I say an ongoing dialogue with God, I'm actually drawing from the original Greek that, with which the New Testament was written in. A.K.A. this wasn't a static thing. It wasn't Jesus just doing this and, and sitting on a bench clearing his mind. It wasn't what a lot of other religions teach primarily, and what's unique about Christianity is in prayer, we are coming to God the person and having a dialogue with him. There's a relational aspect to it, which is different and unique from any of the other world beliefs. Primarily God as Father. And this scene reveals Jesus' dependence on conversation with the Father because as we're going to see in Luke's gospel over and over Jesus is going to do this he's going to retreat to be with his father prior to big moments prior to big decisions prior to a whole bunch of things Jesus will go he knows big days are coming and he goes to be with the father prior to these big days this was a big day because he's picking the 12 and it doesn't say exactly what that conversation was like between the father and with Jesus but I can we can deduce that he's getting discernment about who these 12 are supposed to be And not only is it just the 12, he's about to go heal a ton of people that have come from all over the place to come visit him. So he's showing that he's getting discernment from God, getting getting a download on what his life is supposed to look like, which is encouraging for us, and we get that in prayer. It's amazing sometimes the clarity you get about life and what you should be doing when you just spend some time with God listening. But not only that, he's modeling for his disciples something. He's modeling how... He is going to get away with the Father prior to big events. He wants them to notice, hey, this is what I do every time something's about to happen. So the rest of the scene goes like this, verse uh, 17. It says, When they came down the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone who tried to touch him, or I'm sorry, everyone tried to touch him because healing power went out from him, and he healed everyone. So for a second here, let's imagine this scene. This is wild. This is people from all over the place, all over the region at least. Some that have journeyed days and days to get to him. Um, when it talks about Tyre and Sidon, that's a Phoenician city on the Mediterranean coast now called Lebanon that had come day's journey to come see Jesus. But it wasn't just a a crowd of people. It's a crowd of sick people. People carrying other people, maybe children even. And think about that scene. If you close your eyes, think about Jesus walking down a mountain with his 12 and some of the others that were with him. And they meet a huge crowd of people a crowd of people that had been on a multiple days journey, many of them, that, uh, that likely smelled because, uh, if you can imagine, there weren't proper facilities at this place that they had met him. They're, they're sick with all various types of ailments from s- s- demonic influence and attack to, I'm thinking, open wounds, broken bones, paralyzed, I mean, all kinds of stuff, sights and smells. This was a, a wild scene. And I don't blame them because I was just thinking about, man, if I knew there was a guy like Jesus anywhere near me, I would take anybody sick. I just imagine if one of my boys were sick, 
if one of them had something that was potentially life-changing or terminal, and I heard that there was a healer like Jesus somewhere nearby, you would find any way. I mean, if, if it was back then, I'd throw them on my back, put some, some type of strap on myself, get them on me, get a bag of water, and then grab whoever else from my, my neighborhood and say, hey, I'm going. Anybody want to come with me? And let's go see this guy. If he can heal my kid, I'm going to figure it out. And that is a hungry group of people that have come. Hungry, not in the physical sense, although they probably did after a long journey, but hungry to see God do something that they're desperate for. You have a desperate group of people that have come to see Jesus heal and their family members, their loved ones, or even themselves if they limped their way there. And it says that they were trying to touch him. Isn't that interesting? That they're just trying to reach out and grab him. And we see that elsewhere in Scripture, that the woman in Capernaum who reaches just to touch his robe. And, and similarly to that story, it says they were trying to touch him because healing power went out for him, from him. And we're going to spend a little bit more time on this when we get to that other story I just mentioned. But this is one of the most amazing statements yet in this entire gospel in verse 19. It says that Jesus healed everyone. Everyone. That is wild. A massive group like this. Uh, all of those that we, I was just trying to describe to paint the picture, the sickly, the groaning, the oozing wounds, the limping, the feverish, the coughing and hacking, the sweating. That crowd is now smiling, running around, jumping up and down, laughing, hugging. Uh, it used to be a crowd of sick people who had traveled all the place to now a crowd of healed people that are loving it up and celebrating, and, and it's, a, it's a party. I'm assuming it's a party now. That is a radically different thing. Sick, potentially disgusting crowd group of people that you'd be say, I'm going to keep my distance, social distance here. This, is, this doesn't look good. To everybody is healed. A massive crowd of people and everyone's healthy. That would be incredible to see this happening. Well worth a night in prayer, if I may say. <laughs> if, if that's what it required, a night with dad on the mountain praying. And then this, incredible. It's, it's no wonder that Jesus' fame started to spread rapidly at this point. Both in people that were very angry at him for this type of thing, and then those that the word is spreading. And it's no wonder that people came as far as they did. Just, just for a, a point of reference, actually, Tyre and Sidon is actually closer on the map and mileage of travel than even Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is, is about one and a half times farther than this. So you have people coming from all throughout Israel and out of the country to come visit him. Well, wouldn't you? <laughs> like, wouldn't you? Heck yeah, I would. Even for my toe I broke the other morning, kicking in my chair. I was tired. Long story. So I, I want to draw our attention to the disciples he just picked 12, and he's got a whole bunch of other disciples as well. But they're watching Jesus. And, and they're watching this scene of everybody healed. And this is probably the most sig significant, at least in Luke, this is the most significant healing event that we've seen happen. But it says not just the healing, but they came to hear him teach. They recognized that he had authority. God had anointed this man for something special. They didn't know in fullness who he was, but they know this guy's special. And now the disciples are going, what just happened? I mean, it's one thing to heal. Well, the paralytic was a pretty big deal. We saw the guy's man, the hand get healed last week, but now the crowds? And what, what could he not do? And it's no, it makes uh, no, it's no mystery why they would ask him later, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? I mean, they're, they're wondering. They, they're recognizing that there's a rhythm to this. They come later in Luke chapter uh, 9 that we're going to see, and they ask him, but I have a few examples of this because the disciples had noticed that Jesus had a rhythm of getting away to be with the Father. So I have a list of verses that I'm going to show for you. Luke 5, chapter 16, we already saw when Dane taught a month ago. It said, yet he, speaking of Jesus, frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Then Luke 9, one day as Jesus was praying in private Matthew 14 23 he went up on the mountain by himself to pray Luke 9 this is on the Mount of Transfiguration about eight days after Jesus had said these things he took with him Peter James and John and they went up on a mountain to pray 
And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became radiantly white. That's a transfiguration moment. But all these things, this is Jesus showing his disciples, hey, I have a rhythm. I get away by myself and I spend time with the Father. And then finally in Luke chapter 11, the Jesus uh, is praying and his disciples come up to him and they said, hey, can you teach us to pray how, how John taught his disciples how to pray? Like They want to know, what the heck are you doing up here? What are we missing? You know, t- Teach us, master. You're the master teacher. What's going on? Luke in chapter 11 captures that, and Matthew captures it, captures it in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at both of these. But the disciples notice something. Every time Jesus goes and does this, and then he comes back, something kind of crazy happens. So we want to know, what do we do when we pray? And so Jesus, the master teacher, answers them. Okay, so that's the setup. They come to him, they go, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And here's his answer. Hopefully your ears are pricked up. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, When you go pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Okay, so let me stop for a second. Underline in your Bible, Matthew 6, 8. Your Father knows exactly what you need before you even ask Him. Man, is that good news? This is who you're coming to. Your Father... And he says, your father, three times. He doesn't say my father. He says, your father, our father. He's saying, between you and me, we we have a father in heaven. And it's not just any, it's not like an earthly dad. This is a dad that knows your needs before you even ask. That's the second, second main observation I wanted to point out to you today. Prayer is time with your father. That's what prayer is it's a conversation and it's time with your father just a little little interesting note god doesn't have any grandchildren i think that's just it's just a fun thought uh i'd heard before which means he's engaged fatherly in every single kid uh kid which is us the English pastor and author J.I. Packard in his book Knowing God says this, you can sum up the whole of the New Testament if you describe it as understanding God as one's father. You can sum up the whole New Testament as a revelation of God as father. That's a powerful statement. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Paul Miller, in the book that I just referenced in Praying Life, continues with that same theme. He says, Jesus' example teaches us that prayer is about relationship. When Jesus prays, he's not performing a duty. He's getting close to his Father. Any relationship, if it's going to grow, needs private space, time together without an agenda, where you can just get to know each other. This creates an environment where closeness can happen, where we can begin to understand each other's hearts. You don't create intimacy. You make room for it. This is true whether you're talking about your spouse, your friend, or God. You need space to be together. Efficiency, multitasking, and busyness all kill intimacy. In short, you can't get to know God on the fly. That's observation number three for this morning. You don't create intimacy. You make room for it. That's why the sermon is titled, Making Room. I love... 
the first part of his quote where he says, it's not performing a duty, he's getting close to his father. And creating, you don't create intimacy, you make room for it. It's just a, it's a powerful thought. Uh, the, the pressure is not on you to create, it's just to allow time. Allow time like you would in any relationship. But Jesus didn't just say what I just read in, in Matthew 6. He didn't just end off with, hey, when you go to your father, close the door and all that, and he knows your needs before you ask. Right after he says that, here's what he says, verses 9 to 13. He says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So many of you know what that's called, right? What's that? Oh, come on. The Lord's Prayer, right? So now most of us are memorizing it in the King James Version or the ESV, right? So that's why it's a little off. Or something. We're like, wait a minute, is this biblical? So, uh, but in case you haven't noticed, people aren't really saying hallowed anymore, but... I don't know, maybe you didn't know this. Um, but tragically, though, the Lord's Prayer has actually been used to do what Jesus said don't do. What did he say don't do? Don't be like the Gentiles, that in their babbling and repetition they think God will hear them. Yet, unfortunately, for many of us, the Lord's Prayer has been a babbling repetition that we don't even think about. Depending on which uh, stream of Christianity you grew up with, this was just something you just say because you're supposed to memorize it and because you're Christian. But Jesus didn't say, here's what to pray. He said, pray like this. Catch the difference? There's a difference between here's what to do and here's how you should do it. Because in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke 12, he says, this is how you should pray. And in Matthew 6, 9, he says, pray like this. So he's giving them a pattern to pray through. He wants them to know this. This is loaded with theology. And so if you already know the Lord's Prayer memorized, you're way ahead of the rest of us. So if you're Catholic, you're killing it because it's going to be a huge help if you grew up Catholic. Because now we're going to actually, my goal for the next handful of minutes here is going to teach you the Lord's patterned prayer, which I think was what Jesus actually meant when he taught this. Because he said, hey, this is how you should pray. When you come to your Father, here's how I want you to pray. Check this out, what he's going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to learn a little bit about what Jesus is teaching so we understand the theology of what he's getting across because there's six movements that we're going to see in here, and then we're going to do it together. So my goal from this point forward is now a little bit of a workshop so you feel like you have a better idea. And hopefully, for those of you that know the Lord's Prayer, it's going to click with you because you already know the stanzas and how to roll with it. The rest of us, you'll, you'll catch up pretty soon. Um, my, my hope is maybe that you have a few notes that you can take away, but I think you'll be fine even without them because it's pretty rhythmic. So you're going to notice six movements. I'm going to have the ESV on the screen because the ESV is a lot closer to what most of us have remembered. Um, let me just see with a handful of you in this room if you can repeat the Lord's Prayer. All right, I'll start it off. I'm going to say our Father. All right, ready? One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Let us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. No, 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 no. That's actually not in the Bible. That got added later. Yeah, the whole thine is glory and honor. That's not, and that's not, actually Jesus never taught that. But it's cool, that's true. But anyway, so for the purposes of today, uh, isn't it? Right? It's not. So just, it's a, it is, it's true. But uh, for the purposes of praying the Lord's Prayer, and we're entering the classroom of Jesus right now, of when the disciples ask him, hey, what should we do? What are you doing up here? He gives them this. There's a lot here right now. So there's six movements here. Our Father who art in heaven, okay? That's sonship. So the first movement is sonship. It's recognizing what he just said a few times. This is now the fourth time he said Father, your Father. When you pray, say our Father in heaven. When you come in prayer, you're coming to Dad. You're coming to a Dad that knows your needs before you even ask. So this is a time when you, when you pray our Father. 
is to express gratitude that you've been adopted into the family of God, that that's a finished work. You have a new identity as a child of God. If you're tempted to impress other people by public prayer or private prayer, you feel like, I need to say more, I, I, I need to pray in a certain way so that God will, he's going, no, 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 no. You're my kid, just climb in my lap and talk. That's our father, that's what it means. It's like you're climbing into dad's lap and saying, I just want to talk to you. Thank you that I'm your child and I'm redeemed and all of those things. You're also probably praying potentially missionally, which is, there's a lot of people I know that don't know you as Father, and I really wish they did. So that's appropriate time to pray for those things as well. You're thanking Jesus that because he died and lived the perfect life in your place and rose again, that you're now a child. So you're thanking him that you have this title and inheritance as, as a son. Whether you're male or female, you have sonship rights in Christ. The second thing, hallowed be your name. That means to keep, may your name be kept holy. Holy means set apart, uniquely different. May your, the name of God be so much high and lifted up, the king of all, above all kings. This is also just the uniqueness, uh, the unique, the matchless, supreme, unrivaled, amazingness of God, right? Our, our Father, Sonship, hallowed be thy name. It's worship. Sonship and then worships. God, you are amazing and you are so holy and set apart and different and unique than any other thing and we just want to worship you. It's also an opportunity in, on mission to pray, God, we want more worshipers in our city. We, we want, I, want to, I want to know how to worship you more and I just want to see our world worshiping you and not worshiping other things. Third, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the Maranatha prayer of God, bring your kingdom to earth. This is an appropriate time to pray things like, by the way, in heaven there's no sin, there's no death, there's no decay, there's no disease, there's no rape, there's no assault, there's no idolatry, there's no nightmares, there's no oppression, there's no anxiety, there's no kidnapping there's no stealing there's no victimization there's no rich and poor there's none of that in heaven right now there's a lot of that on earth right now and we're saying god bring to earth what your kingdom is like in heaven bring it restore and redeem it's it's to recognize and appropriately grieve all the things that are off and broken in our world so we're praying things like lord Lessen the tears. There's no pain in heaven. Lessen the pain. There's, there's no paralyzed in heaven. Lessen, heal the paralyzed. Heal the afflicted. It's bringing his kingdom to earth. We're praying, God, change things. Change things. And Jesus is telling us to pray this. Change this. In heaven, there's only honesty, mercy, compassion, justice, worship. Perfect all the time. That's What's happening in heaven right now? We're saying, Lord, bring that to earth. Bring that to earth. Then fourth is provision. Give us today our daily bread. It's saying, Jesus is recognizing we're dependent on God for every breath in our lungs. And every meal we get, even though we think we bought it with our money, it's because God has provided for us richly. So we're asking God for all of the things that we need. This is bringing a posture of dependence to the Father and saying, everything I have and everything I need is going to be come from you in some way. And so I come to you for everything. Our previous breath, our next breath, our heart to continue beating, the air in our lungs, all of those things is being sustained by the word of his power, scripture tells us. This is also a time now to think of ourselves and what we actually need that we don't have. So he's saying, give us our daily bread is permission for us to ask God for everything, no matter how big or small. And corporately, what does our church family need? What does our neighborhood need? What does our city need? What does our county need? What does our country need? This is time to pray those things for provision. It's also, I think, an appropriate time to ask God to help us to be wise stewards of the things that we're asking him for and the things we already have. Help us make, make us like you, that we don't hold on to our stuff, but that we have soft hearts and we're being faithful with all that we've given. And then the fifth movement is reconciliation. When, when Jesus says, forgive us our debts or our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us or debted against us or trespass, whatever word you're using. 
This is an opportunity to reflect that, like, I need to repent of my own sins and help me to forgive those who've sinned against me as well. We're recalling the fact that only by God's grace have we been made right. That we haven't earned forgiveness back, it's by his grace that he gives it to us, and we're helping our, helping our hearts would understand that by praying it. It's repentance and faith. Both in our own personal sins and idolatry and just the hardness of heart and things like that. But then it's also corporate repentance. As we look around our, our, even our church or our country or our nation, whatever it is, saying, Lord, we repent that we just have a lack of concern for the poor. We have a, we have a lack of sacrifice. We, we, have, we have a lack of love. We have a lack of evangelism, you know, it, it, both in our life personally and for those around us. We look around and we're grieving the sins of our world and saying, God, forgive us and help us to forgive those that are doing the same things. A little dose of humility. And we're asking God for his grace that he would help us to change, change our hearts. And then the last portion of the, the protection piece where it says, uh, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Um, it's, I just want to make a point here. In the, the actually, I, the Pope just went to bat for this for a revision of the Lord's Prayer because um, God doesn't tempt anyone to prayer. And the way they translate this in the New King James would uh, kind of make you believe, well, don't lead us into temptation. Wait a minute, God leads people into temptation, and that's the whole point. No, He doesn't. It's a really poor, poor translation of the Greek. It, it literally means to uh, when you allow for temptation. Help us to resist. That's what he's asking. And then protect us from the evil one. James 1.13 says, God tempts no one. Period. When you allow temptation, though, God, deliver us from it. I mean, he allowed temptation into Jesus' life. We already saw that at the beginning of Luke. To be tempted isn't, isn't sin. To give in to temptation is when sin manifests itself. So we're saying, God, we know Satan's going to attack us. We know there's a spiritual warfare. We know there's cultural pressures that are coming against us to tempt us to live in ways that are different from what you'd have for us. Give us hearts that don't want those things. Help it to just bounce off. Bind Satan's power to tempt people that's happening in our lives or people around us. Give us a heart that love what you love and hate what you hate. To love righteousness and hate evil and be against it. Spirit, give us the eyes to see temptation. So we might even be able to cry out before it's too late and we're in a place that we just can't help ourselves. Father, help me to believe the gospel. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a prayer right there in temptation. Help me to believe that I actually have everything in you and I don't need to look elsewhere. Okay, that's it. Those are the six rhythms. I want you to understand the heart behind all of those. There's no one right way to pray, pray the Lord's pattern prayer. But if you just know the lines on it, or you haven't memorized at all, it will lead you into form of praying. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to spend just our final time together actually praying through this. We're going to spend three minutes, uh, two to three minutes, on each of these sections here. So I'm going to say the words, Our Father in Heaven, and then I'm going to just pray a couple things about that, and I'm going to give you a moment of silence to pray about that reality of your sonship. I'll remind you of kind of the, the movements of it. And then I'll move to the next one. Give, give a space, then I'll go to the next one. Hallowed be your name. May your name be kept holy. And I'll pray a little bit, and I'll leave it blank. Does that make sense? Okay, so join me with prayer. Father, you're our Father in heaven. That alone is just such good news. Thank you. That when I get to pray, I don't have to pray God or, or I have to plead that you would listen. But when I and my brothers and sisters pray, we pray to a dad that loves us dearly and says, I always want you. And you have my ear. And I am so thankful for that. And I also pray for those that don't know you as dad, don't know that they can pray, Father, that you'd use us as a church to make that possible, to introduce them to a father that loves them.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May your name be kept holy. God, you are you're beyond the ability of human language to describe in your glory, in your perfect love. You're, there's no one like you. It makes sense why everyone that ever had a vision of your throne room or entered your presence f- just fell down like they were going to die. They, it's as if our beings almost rupture, as if we were going to try to walk on the surface of the sun and we just, we would just melt. Yet, yet you make yourself known, which is incredible. We worship you this morning because you are holy. You are unique and set apart. your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Father we just understand your lordship and at this time we're praying that you would bring your kingdom to earth as it is in heaven we know right now in heaven that there are no anxiety No one has anxiety in your presence. They feel cared and loved. We ask that your your kingdom would come on all those struggling with anxiety right now and depression. They experience your kingdom here on earth right now through that. Lord, we know in your kingdom there is no there's no isolation. There's no oppression. There's no demonic oppression. There's no violence. There's no fear. Lord, bring your, bring your kingdom in those places in our society. In Oceanside, we ask for your kingdom to come in Oceanside. Relieve pain and suffering. Remove it. Bring love, Jesus. So in this next moment of silence, you're just praying for the kingdom of God to invade all the broken places of our lives and our neighborhoods.
God, we look forward to the day that you come back and bring your kingdom in fullness. Can't wait for that day to be with you in your kingdom. See this all redeemed and restored. Moving on from there, give us today our daily bread. So we're asking God right now for provision, primarily physically. Father, we recognize that everything we have is from you. We ask for forgiveness as we're often tempted to believe that what we have is from us. Um, but you've showered us with grace, every breath in our lungs. The fact that our bodies woke up and worked this morning is it? You're the sustainer of all things. We, we just ask for, um, I ask right now for uh, the families that have let us know that right now is a really uh, uh, hard time financially, that, that even in the next month they're concerned about how they're going to make, make rent and bills and things like that. Um, I ask for provision. Supernaturally through that, I pray for generosity to be stirred in hearts. Uh, to meet those needs. Pray, pray for humility to ask. Lord, we ask for provision. We, we ask for uh, businesses with, and safety to be able to reopen. We ask for um, money to be spent. We ask for wisdom for policymakers to um, help our country and the world's economies recover. I pray for uh, broken bodies in this room and in our church family, in our city. We, we ask for restoration and healing. So now's the time just to ask God for anything you need, anything you need. He, he wants you to ask right now. So spend this next minute just asking him. In the fifth movement, forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. We pray for reconciliation here. Uh, God, we first and foremost come to you to repent of our own sins, to recognize that we're unlike you in so many ways, even though we know clearly the way we should go, we choose otherwise. Instead of biting our lip, we lash out. Instead of forgiving, we latch on to bitterness and resentment. But we're thankful that Jesus, you died in our place so that when you look at us, you don't see, you don't see resentful people. You see your, your dearly loved children that were washed clean. And so we thank you, or that you've reconciled us back to yourself, that now we're homely, blameless, without a single fault as we stand before you. Help us to see that ourselves accurately, that we are forgiven and redeemed, that we wouldn't shame ourselves and be hard on ourselves, and that we also wouldn't do that with others. Father, we recognize we're often quick to hold someone else accountable to something that, or judge someone for something that we do equally the same, or if not worse. And yes, you would forgive us. We know you do. And help us to forgive others. We also repent, just Lord, of it as... Uh, the Christian community and our lack of concern for the poor oftentimes, our lack of uh, grace for one another, our quickness to be judgmental, our, the way we divide, and instead of looking at each other as brother and sister, we can look at each other as enemy or inconvenience or however else we view 
how quick we are when people get in our way of doing things our way, we can vilify them, Lord, and we know that is not your heart at all. In fact, you died for your enemies and you love your enemies. Help us to be that way. So spend the next minute and asking God to both forgive our debts and those that are indebted to us or sinned against us. And lastly, don't let us yield to temptation, Lord Jesus, but rescue us from the evil one. Father, we recognize that not only is the enemy tempting us to give in and to worship things other than you and to focus on our fears and focus on ourself and uh, afflict us in different ways, but there's also a system of the world that is set against you in in many ways. to set other things up as God, to get us to worship new products and all the things that we supposedly need to make ourselves complete. We just help, we ask you to help us to resist, to not just lazily float down the river of culture and uh, do as everyone else does, Lord, but to have hearts that yearn for you and your ways. So Father, we ask you to help us to believe the gospel. Help us to stand in our new identity as sons and daughters. Help us to see what you see and not the way we've been trained to see or what others have told us to see. Help us to see people as redeemable, lovable, worth serving. Give us hearts that reflect yours, Lord. And don't let us yield to the temptation to do nothing or to live for ourselves. So take this moment. Just ask God, your Father, to help you, to rescue you from the evil one and anything, any evil force that might come against you. Amen. One of the big things I take away from Jesus' modeling of prayer is that he kind of covers every aspect of life. And that's, that's, what, that's what dad in his time with us wants to know. Hey, I care about every need before you even ask in every area of your life, so please come freely and come often. So I encourage you, if you know the Lord's prayer, to spend some time going through that. Hopefully that was simple. Um, I wanted to spend enough time doing it so you could sort of give yourself opportunities at each, each frame to, to do that. Um, we're going to continue to do prayer walk, workshops when we can get together, so at some point we'll do this again. But hopefully you've already seen, and just even in the last couple months, we've prayed through the ACTS, the ACTS prayer. We've done palms down, palms up. We've done, we did psalms last week. We've done a whole bunch of different ways of praying, but one of the things I love about the Lord's pattern of prayer is Jesus taught us it. So, it's just, <laughs> so some of the other ones, they're great, and they're helpful, and they work. And uh, even like the, yeah, there's just so many great things out there on prayer, but it's really cool when Jesus, the master teacher, brings you in and says, hey, here's how to pray, and here's some things I want you to keep in mind. Um, I'll end with this, which is, 
Jesus, every single time he prayed throughout the scriptures, said, prayed to his father. He addressed God as father, except once on the cross. And he, it's recorded that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus on the cross, cross drank the cup of suffering on our behalf and cried out, my God, my God, we the ones who actually deserve to drink from the cup of suffering because of our sin and our rebellion, we get to drink from the cup of blessing. And instead of crying out, my God, my God, we get to cry out, Father. It's the beautiful exchange in the gospel. That's what he did for us. So that we now in Christ, in Jesus' name when we pray, get to come and say, my Father, who's in heaven. We get to say that every time. Yeah. So thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you that you gave us the right to be called sons and daughters. That now, as Romans 8 would say, we get to cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, when we come to you. And I know there's some of us that have trouble with that. Maybe we didn't have dads that were nurturing like that. Maybe we didn't have dads that were safe to crawl in your lap. That's hard. That's a hard thing to call you dad, to call you father, to relate to you in that way. But I pray that we would not allow our woundings or our concept of God to, uh, or dad to cloud who you are. I pray that you, the revelation of who you are as father would be deeper and more resilient. I do pray for those right now that have woundings of dads who abandoned, dads who were neglectful or abusive. I pray for those wounds right now in the power in the name of Jesus Christ to heal those wounds, to heal those deep fissures in the soul that stop people from connecting with you as Father and that you, Father, right now would powerfully penetrate that soil. You would hit people's hearts and they would see you as you really are. They would see the image of people in your arms, themselves in your arms as a good, good Father. I pray that would happen and that in prayer it would be a sweet place of privacy between you, the lover and creator of our joy, and us, and me, and my brothers and sisters. Amen. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to tune out. To